I'm Andy Rotherham. I'm joined by former Tennessee Governor Phil Brez Bredesen. We are uh, going to kick this off, and then we have a, uh, a terrific panel that's going to join us, uh, three former state chiefs uh, across three chiefs, but across five states. And the topic is the topic of the day. Just uh, a little bit ago, the Department of Education sent out allocation tables and so forth for the American Rescue Plan Act, which is an unprecedented infusion of money into many areas of American life, but particularly education uh, and, and the public sector uh, adjacent to education. And that's what we're gonna talk about today is opportunities uh, for this, this money to be transformative with an eye towards equity and addressing some of the problems we've had, not only with the pandemic, but problems that have, have preexisted the pandemic. There's also a risk, just given what I'm sure everybody on this webinar knows about uh, how our sector can work, that this money could get absorbed, uh, could be like a wave coming across the beach and you wouldn't know it was there uh, a little bit later. And so we want to talk about what are some ways to avoid that, what are some strategies. And what's terrific, I think, about our discussion today is we have people who were there in 2009 with um, uh, the last time we had a big recovery act with Aura, who can share some lessons, learn perspectives, what they did differently, and we'll we'll move from that into into talking about uh, the situation now. So, Governor, I'm going to start just with you. You were there. Uh, you were a two-term governor of Tennessee, and in your second term, uh, the economic downturn hit, the Great Recession, and then the Recovery Act, and you led all through that. Uh, and so what did you what did you learn? And as you think about the Biden package now, like what did you learn then? How are you thinking about this package and how do you see the situation? Yeah, I think uh, it was it was a, obviously an interesting and challenging time. I do think it's important to emphasize that the worlds are very different today. Back when the uh, ARRA came in, I mean, <clears throat> the world was just coming apart and the financial system was melting down. The auto industry was going bankrupt. Uh, uh, just holding things together became the thing we were trying to do. But I think the good news today is that is that while there's been terrible human cost from this, the economy has not suffered nearly as badly. Um, and uh, there's obviously more money in this package, even you know twice as much, even counting for inflation. Um, and so I think it really presents a real um, uh, a real opportunity that in a lot, a lot of ways wasn't there for the ARRA. Um, you asked the question about kind of what you what you learn from that, and, and I sort of assumed you would. And um, I'd, I'd say three things. Um, first of all, I think it's important. I just first of all do do no harm with this um, for anybody who's been in the uh, in the political environment. Um, you know, there's a big danger with this federal money in establishing spending that you're not able to maintain. I know when I was I was mayor of Nashville before I was governor, and uh, Clinton put in a package to uh, to uh, hire a lot of police officers. Well, how can you turn that down? Hire police officers, but you know it's 100 percent for a couple of years, and then it's 50 percent, and then it's zero percent, and suddenly it's the poor mayors who are having to explain why they have to either raise taxes or <laughs> or cut back on the police force in, in some way. And so I think there's a lot of danger. And particularly with the money flowing a lot into the LEAs in this package, where there's less centralized planning and control of it, um, uh, I think there's a danger of making sure that that uh, that states and localities don't get into a position where they're just building themselves a box and a brick wall, or the um, uh, when when this money is finally uh, finally used out. We had a particular way to deal with that when I was governor, and happy to talk about it. Second thing is, I think, you know, this is an opportunity to really, um, to really plan for and invest for some, some uh, lasting change. Um, the emergency is less immediate. There's lots of money. The time horizon is longer. And, you know, there's a lot of talk about COVID slide and so on, but we don't want to let that dominate our thinking because this really is a once in a generation kind of opportunity, I think, to really do some long-term planning. And there's a lot of issues out there digital divide, early childhood literacy, the whole role of technology, I think is gonna come front and center um, after, you know, after, after 2020. And then the third thing I say is just, you know, what I learned is it's, you know, it's important to use this gift that you have of time and money to build political consensus. Um, education reform has to survive multiple administrations to really work. And you can't do that if it's a Democratic reform or Republican reform or Bill Bredesen's reform or something else. When we did all the work uh, in Tennessee, um, even though I'm kind of a policy wonk, I mean, I probably spent 10% of my time on the policy and 90% on just building some consensus and getting Tennessee 
uh, across the board to own the program, and that you know, and that took uh, some compromises as well. But uh, the good news is, is that even even though the governorship changed hands and changed parties, um, there were enough people bought into a strategy that it was able to continue over a period of time. It's had some great some great results. Um, money uh, focuses thought. It makes it a little easier to do these to do these things. You're not just arguing about ideology, but there's actually some money and. People either do or don't want to be a part of how it's used and how it's distributed. It makes it possible to build that. But um, I think there, are, I, I'm sure the, the the others on this panel have a lot of lessons of their own from that. But those, uh, you know, those three things don't don't do any harm and use it to build consensus and try to use it for the long run as much as you can. It's a once in a once in a generation kind of opportunity. Were the three things that I took out of it. A couple of follow-ups. You said you have that you had some ways that you use the money to avoid this this building in cliffs and so forth. Could you talk about that and also talk about the tension between, you know, there's a lot of concern, and we're going to talk later also with with the state chiefs about the maintenance of effort uh, here. And will states just use this just to you know it, will we lose the emphasis on equity? So how do the, how do you reconcile those two things? Don't don't build in things you can't afford, but at the same time. Make sure that this doesn't just become fungible, fungible money. How did how did you do that? I would say first of all, the maintenance of effort stuff was one of the biggest problems we dealt with because you know if you're governor and you've got a lot of responsibilities and you're trying to move these things around a little bit and try to figure out how to how to do things and and uh, we got in some real problems with that. And fortunately, the ARRA did not have a lot of a lot of that stuff in it. Um, the way we approached it is uh, we figured it would take about five years. It was the best guess we had to get back to normal from where we were in 2008 or so. And in fact, that's, that's exactly what happened. Um, so in addition to the one-year budget, I also did each year a five-year budget. It didn't have any um, legal standing, but what you had done is to think through um, how much revenue you're going to have, how much one-time money you might have from the ARRA, what your expenses were going to be, and, and had a plan for that, period, that entire period of time that ended you up back at neutral when the, uh, when the money was, uh, was used up. And it was a very useful planning tool. And frankly, also politically was helpful because some of the more painful cuts that we had to make, um, you know, if you put them three years out in the future, they're a lot easier for legislatures to deal with than if it's something they're, you know, they're going to go home, people are going to, are going to talk about. But we had a good comprehensive plan and the, uh, the new governor inherited the last year and a half of it, and stuck with it. And I think it, uh, I think that approach worked really well to just make sure we were thinking through the entire sequence of what was going to happen with the money and that it would all be on a level playing field at the end. Okay, so one more question before we bring in Deb, Lillian, and Ken. You mentioned sort of this building consensus, and you did. You had a reputation. You were you, know, you had a reputation that you you were pragmatic on education. You weren't a partisan, and so forth. Obviously, these are just really fraught times uh, politically. You know, stuff that we used to say, well, that happens in Washington, but at least that doesn't happen in the states. Now it's happening in the states, and even in some cities. Uh, so just talk about that from your time both as a mayor and then your time uh, as governor, like. What do we need to do, based on your experience, what do we need to do to start to get back to education being a little less of a partisan, a little bit more of a pragmatic issue? You know, I, I think it's a combination of things. I mean, number one, I think, you know, for any politician, for either party, I mean, just eschewing the opportunity to try to go weaponize some particular thing you, dis you disagree with. Um, and I think that has to start with a governor or a mayor. I mean, you can't, I mean, I couldn't go ahead and weaponize it and expect everybody else to be bipartisan, uh, bipartisan about it. Um, I found when you had to make cuts um, to make things, make cuts that were in things that were known to be important to you first. So when we had to cut, it wasn't, it wasn't a matter of I'm going to keep all my stuff and I'm going to cut all the stuff I don't like. Um, I had started actually a school, a residential high school for STEM, for STEM training, which had been quite, you know, quite successful. We had 60 or 70 kids and I loved it. I mean, my background's in physics and, and uh, I love to do that. And that was the first thing I caught. And it was very painful, but it sent a message that, uh, you know, we're, we're all, uh, this is extraordinary circumstance. We're all in this, uh, we're all in this together. And um I think there's things you can, you can learn there. And then the last one I'd say is just, is just when you, 
when you put together what you want to do with the money, if all you do is look at the current Democratic or Republican playbook about stuff, you're going to end up with stuff which is naturally contentious. I think you've got to step way back from that and say, what are some things, me as I'm a Democrat, what are some things that I can incorporate that I think would be important to Republicans as well? I was very interested in the standards movement, and there was a lot of interest in that on the, uh, on the Republican side. And it was, uh, we incorporated a lot of that stuff in the things we did with the, with the money. So a lot of the people on this webinar, there's, there's folks who are in government and so forth and are going to be directly making policy. But a lot of the folks on this call, they work for advocacy groups, business groups, different sort of folks adjacent. What's your advice for them in sort of helping someone who wants to do what you just said, figure out ways to, to get things done? What's your advice for those groups? How can they be most effective in, in, in supporting that and creating the conditions for it? You know, the ethics of the groups that were that were most helpful and most persuasive to me, and I think got the most done, were the ones that sort of had some understanding um, and recognized the sort of complexity of the issue that a governor or the mayors were, you know, were, were dealing with. And we're not, <clears throat> we're not always totally hard-nosed about this is what we want and we're not budging an inch from that and you're stupid if you don't think this is the right thing to, this is the right thing to do. Um, so I'd say to someone that if you just, you know, uh, recognize there's there's a time for drawing lines in the sand, but when you got an opportunity like this, that is not this is not one of them. And uh, for those advocacy groups to um, think what they'd like to see out of it and recognize that they may get some of it, but there are um, there's always plenty of uses on the money, and and uh, you know governors and legislators are trying to find a path through all that and do the things which they think are best. You know, the big difference between states and the federal government is we all, all but one of us, all but Vermont, have got very strong balanced budget requirements. And so you just like, you just can't push these things off. You have to deal with issues and governors have got to decide. You know, in my case, education was really, really important to me. You know, but so were uh, so were our children's services for damaged children. Um, so were the things we did for, um, you know, I mean, uh, adults on the social side and 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 so on. And you're always trying to balance those things. And I think that advocacy groups recognize those pressures. They can they can really be effective and constructive. Terrific, thank you. You're going to stay with us. We're bringing in Lillian Lowry, Deb Gist, and Ken Wagner. Uh, they will be joining us here in just a moment. Lillian, I'm going to start with you because winner's prerogative. Uh, so you, you, you know, race to the top and all that. So it's not, it's not that long ago. I'll start with you. Like when you look back on the Recovery Act and uh, your experience, what did you learn? What, what would you, what, what did you think worked the best and what would you, what would you do differently? Then we'll sort of get into this, the, the Biden package. Great, thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Lillian Lowry. I am currently a vice president and CEO of Student and Teacher Assessment with ETS. Um, I learned what I, I'm, a lot of what I'm going to share is a segue from what the governor has just said. Um, the first is um, around the, the maintenance of effort, right? Um, because one of the things that we did in Delaware is where I first started this work before moving to Maryland with, with Governor Bretonson and his team, uh, we worked very closely together, um, was up front putting the plan together, which was already aligned to what we were strategically planning in the state anyway, determining what the different elements of the plan would be, costing each one out, what would be capacity building to build systems, to build um, capabilities among the people who would be there when the money's gone, and what would be left as long-term execution on improving education writ large. And what we, I remember the, the price tag was a little over $8 million a year once all of the AARA money went away, the state legislative um, education committees and Governor Markell asked, what will it cost us if we spend all of this money to build all of these systems, we're building them for a reason, once this money goes away, how much will it cost us every year in budget to sustain it, $8 million. What Maryland did on the other hand was actually pass a maintenance of effort local policy, which said the LEAs, the districts, must fund at a certain level every year. 
And once they fund at that level, they can't drop it. So it made districts and LEAs a little nervous about, do we increase the budget this year? Because once we increase it, we have to stay there. So it informed policy about how we think about funding. The, the second thing is, um, what do we do? And some of us didn't know going into the ARA, the race to the top, we do know now because we've lived through this past year, what does implementation look like? Because I, the money was spent wisely, it was spent in a targeted way based on evidence and data. And everyone was holding hands, singing Kumbaya as we were building it. When we got to the implementation phase, that's where things started to kind of get a little off track. So my advice to all of the people who are getting this money is to make sure that as you're going through, you're also attending to the politics of the work, that when we build these systems, when we put these safeguards in place for our students, this is what it will look like you know, path forward. Um, and then, then the third thing is um, really to pay attention to the data, right? Uh, we knew what some of the data were. Uh, we didn't actually know how profoundly we were going to impact people's lives as we implemented new standards. And what we did was bring everybody to the table to help us do that. The teachers were there with us every step of the way. We looked at the standards, they unpacked the standards with us so we could build a curricula. They said, the teachers, that it was the best professional development they had ever had because they were actually going standard by standard, unpacking it, pulling out the skills and knowledge that students should master, and then helping us build curricula. To the point that when I left Delaware to go to Maryland, seamless, because the people in the schools in the district owned the work. When I left Maryland, and there was some push in the General Assembly to kind of, um, dissemble some of the work. It was the teachers and the people in the field who said, absolutely not. We spent four years doing this work and it is important to us. We own it as ours. So maintenance of effort, one more thing, and then I'll leave, go back to the first point. This is a lot of money for LEAs and districts. And you, there's a finite period of time, 2023, this money has to be spent. While we know we all need the money, we're not used to that type of money. One has to pay attention to the spend and make sure that we don't get to the end and then we just start spending money because we don't want to give any back. We need to be thoughtful about that, but there also needs to be some kind of key performance indicators quarterly or something to track how the money is being spent to make sure we're spending it and if, if whether or not we need to pivot on it. So maintenance of effort, follow the money so that you spend it all usefully, make sure that we put the politics alongside the spend so people understand what implementation looks like and things don't fall apart. And then lessons learned, not only during what we know is a regular uh, way of looking at attendance and student performance, but what have we learned during this pandemic that will inform the spend? We know where we need to spend the money. We know where there are gaps. Okay, Deb. So over to you. Same question, but I'm, I'm pretty. You know, you led two SEAs, but now you're a local superintendent in a in a large size school district. But you you run an LEA out in Tulsa. Talk about like what you learned, and then also from now being in this seat as a local superintendent, wish what you wish you knew uh, in terms of in terms of using recovery dollars. What what you've learned in your current in your current seat that you didn't know when you were at the SEA. Right. Well, I mean, for one thing, I would say that as a, as a local school district, the main thing I want our state to do is to not make things harder and to <laughs> let us <laughs> have the space to do what we need to do. So there are some really important lessons in that uh, just alone. Okay, I do you, have, you, have got, you have gone local then, all right. <laughs> I do want to, I'm gonna answer your question, but I also wanna just make sure that we're um, acknowledging that this is, while there are similarities and while there are lessons learned that we need to uh, keep at the forefront, this is also a very different situation. And um, so, you know, we, when the ARA money was there, um, especially if you're thinking about race to the top, it was specifically designed to be transformative. It was specifically designed for um, how to improve the educational experience. And, 
the, you know, where we are now is that we are also having an economic crisis, which has had a huge impact on, on our communities, on our families. We also have this massive public health crisis that has created also a mental health crisis. We have the, the public health crisis of racism that while it's not new, it is something that we're all uh, addressing um, uh, much more intentionally uh, now that we understand like really the depths of what we have uh, before us and uh, and taking that more seriously as we should have been previously. But we also have the educational crisis that has come from this year of massive disruption to the school experience. And so when you think about the investment of these dollars, you have to understand all of the ways in which those different crises play into what the needs are and what our um, each school district is going to need to be tackling. So, um, so I just want to acknowledge that. So a couple of quick examples. I mean, one from an economic standpoint, um, like other urban districts across the country and other districts for that matter, we lost, you know, really significant enrollment during this year. And so the need to, you know, find kids, you know, reach out to families, do this kind of community work, but also the financial impact that the, that, that enrollment can have on districts and the way in which these funds need to help us to not have to have like immediate and urgent changes that then disrupt the system so that we're not able to serve the kids when they come back. You know, there are those kind of factors involved. Um, and then the educational recovery sort of for students and the need to provide them with supports. At the same time, we do want to be transformative. We don't want to just use um, these investments as transactional kinds of investments. So for your question, I would say a few things. Um, you know, it's one thing I would say is that it is so easy to hear and to say that, you know, we shouldn't waste a crisis, that we're gonna use this moment of disruption to bring about real change. Well, I have heard that far too many times in my, you know, almost 35 year career. Um, it's much harder to make that actually true. And so um, one way I think we can do it is by really focusing um, when you, when you have a big investment of money, which these recovery dollars are into our schools, it's easy to think that there are, you know, the needs are so great and it's very, very difficult to narrow and to focus. And so I think narrowing and focus is hugely important. Um, I also will just agree uh, with the governor and, and with Lillian about the uh, sustainability component of that and how intentional you have to be very, very explicitly about how to plan for that. But the other caution I would add to it is that the, the sustainability, the, that it takes longer than you think to ramp something up and more effort than you think to prepare for the sustainability of it. That you, that, you know, you can kind of think, okay, well, the first year we're going to do this and then we're going to start to invest more locally or we're gonna change the structure or whatever. And so that'll be three years. And then really when you're like, okay, the, the ramp up, you know, that was six months of that first year. It's, it just, it all takes a lot longer than you think it's going to. So you have to plan for that and be realistic about what you take on both in terms of scope, but also in terms of the time frame. Um, so I have others, but I'll, I'll stop there. I wanna hear from Ken too. And I know the group probably does as well. So, I want to emphasize what uh, Lillian mentioned before, which is the capacity to implement. Uh, it, it, this is a huge amount of money, and states are not good at spending a huge amount of money in a short period of time. And we definitely learned that during Race to the Top. And I know it's, it's boring to think about, but there's a lot of uh, issues around procurement and contracting and legal services that if you don't pay attention to it at the beginning of the process, it, it's just gonna come back to bite you later. Nobody wants to go on record as funding more procurement capacity in a state education department or more legal capacity, in this, but it's, it's super important. So that's the first thing. The second thing is we spend so much time thinking about what we're gonna fight about and we don't often think about what we agree about. And there are very specific high impact, high consensus initiatives that we could, we could have been launching for the past five or 10 years and we should have been, and we should certainly 
continue to work on. Things like early learning, quality curriculum, aligned professional development to implement the curriculum, thinking about uh, career exploration and career education pathways for students. There is near universal agreement on those initiatives. There's lots of evidence of high impact. Should, we should absolutely focus on those kinds of things. Doesn't mean we shouldn't fight around the edges. We absolutely should pick things that get people uncomfortable. And if I were picking two things that would get people uncomfortable, the two I would pick are we have to really get serious about diversifying the workforce. We've been spending so many years talking about how our workforce does not look like the communities we serve. And there are very few absolute, actual concrete implementations to change that trajectory. And that means we have to have very critical conversations with our, our partners in higher education about whether or not their patterns of service delivery are tied to tuition dollars or are tied to what everybody talks about but doesn't necessarily focus on, which would be social justice. We have to put diversity of the workforce front and center. And the second thing, and this makes a lot of different people uncomfortable, to me, this is an opportunity not just to think about quality from the top down, but to think about quality and opportunity from the bottom up, which means you have to put a choice agenda on the table as well. It doesn't have to be big dramatic school choice. It can also be smaller projects around course choices. There are lots of initiatives to get course opportunities in front of students, but not necessarily have the gatekeepers control all of the opportunities and be the, the arbitrage of whether or not it's quality. And you have to think about not just charter schools, but also private schools and other kinds of school models. The last thing I'll mention is when I came into this field back in the, uh, in the 90s, there was this mantra of special education. I came in as a school psychologist. Special education is a service, not a place. Special ed should be something that we wrap around students no matter where they are. They shouldn't be over here, over there. We should wrap around services around students. And I think if one thing the pandemic did is it, it's gonna force us to rethink that idea of education being a service, not a place. Kids can claim and acquire their learning in so many different places. And if we don't have a service that's nimble to let students demonstrate and claim their learning and go even farther in a way that better reflects their lived experiences, whether their uh, lived experiences related to their communities or their career aspirations or everything that they believe in, then we haven't really moved the system. And that means we all have to get uncomfortable. The adults have to get uncomfortable. The families have to get uncomfortable. Our legacy systems, how do we really move the system to be truly hybrid that does not give up on the magic in classrooms between teachers and kids, but dramatically extends that by letting kids acquire and claim learning in non-traditional spaces and finding ways to move that into the rest of our uh, credential system. All right, so let's pick up an idea you put on the table as being illustrative. And Lillian, uh, this is a question for all four of you. Lillian will be back. She's having a little bit of, of tech trouble. So you've all said this is different between 2009 and 2021. The governor said that at, at the top, just given the nature of the crisis. And, and that's certainly true. One of the differences, though, is like a lot of states, there are some states that are in, in bad financial shape because of industries and so forth. But a lot of the states are in much better shape, as the governor said, than people thought they would be in, you know, a year ago last March when, when, when this set up. And so there is an opportunity to use this money to address opportunities. Like, so can you put diversifying the teaching workforce on the table? And that's a huge opportunity that's in front of us. So how do we like, and, and this is both a question politically and from a policy perspective, how would you encourage leaders to balance those priorities? Because the pressure is going to be to spend this money in certain ways, uh, maybe more in the near term, rather than thinking about how do you plan, how do we do something like a major effort to diversify the teacher workforce or some of the other the other priorities people are talking about? Like, it seems like the fact that things aren't as bad is obviously that's good news in general, but it creates a challenge here uh, and an opportunity with these dollars. Well, to me, it's an 80-20 thing, right? If you can find agreement on 80% of the work and get consensus and movement on 80% of the work, then you have some political capital to push people out of their comfort zones on the 20% of the work, but you've got to pick that 20% carefully. It may be different from state to state and from district to district. I picked the two things that would be on my list, but I, no doubt they, they might be different from state to state and district to district. But then once you, you find that, you, you need to find, of course, the people who uh, agree that those should be priorities. If there's any moment to me that is more ready for dramatic change and involves not just K-12, but higher ed, critically involves higher ed, 
is there's an opportunity to really reflect whether or not our, our learning pipeline, and, and to me, a future teacher starts at least in high school. And if kids have a horrible experience in high school, why on earth would they wanna be a teacher? So if you wanna think about social justice later in the pipeline, in terms of future teachers, you have to think about social justice, about how we're treating kids disproportionately or not in middle school and high school. So you need to change their learning experiences so they wanna become future teachers. The diversity of the workforce is largely a, a networking and, and, and recruiting problem. It's, it's not that there aren't talented people of all backgrounds out there. We just don't have the right networks with each other. And it has to start with high school relationships. Governor, how would you handle that? You know, a situation where it's obviously a K-shaped recovery. There's there's a lot of people who are doing pretty well. There's a second group that's that's really been hit hard by this, particular industries and so forth that have been more disrupted by the pandemic, don't have the opportunity to work remotely and those sorts of things. So you've got that problem. You have overall state spending that might just be a percent or two off of, of what we expected, but not sort of, again, not as, as dire as, as we thought it would be. Uh, last year, how would you manage that opportunity to then you politically use those dollars to sort of address big challenges over the next few years and not just have them get frittered away? Yeah, I think that the, uh, I mean, I, keeping money together to be able to spend significant dollars on something is really important. I mean, a um, hundred dollars is a lot more valuable than a hundred times one dollar. I mean, it's, it's bringing money together and in the, in 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 a quantity sufficient to actually go make changes in the world is is, is difficult to do. It's one of the great opportunities that this that, that this presents. Um, I think it's a matter. I mean, just handling it politically. Um, I mean, obviously, the, to the extent there are things that obviously need to be dealt with in the short term. I mean, a shortfall of some sort that really is cutting cutting deep in some area. Um, you may have different parts of a state that are experiencing very different things. I mean, Tennessee has a Nashville where things are going wonderfully, and it's got rural counties that are really struggling um, in this uh, in this pandemic. You may need to be sensitive sensitive to that. But I think the big thing in my mind is just I mean to be down just down and dirty political about it is the difference now is that you've got a bunch of money you can dangle out here, and um, you can find an awful lot of people um, who are willing to do some stuff. Um, if, they, if the money is there, it is going to be spent. And if they want to be a part of the decision-making process about how it's spent, they've got to come to the table and, and be, re be realistic about some of these kinds of things. I mean, I know this is not the ARRA, but when we got the uh, race to the top money, that was $500 million in the case of Tennessee. I mean, I used that to get things done. I never could have gotten done on my own. I mean, things done through the legislature. If I'd simply walked into a session of the legislature and said, I want to do this, um, I would not have gotten anywhere with it. When I say, I want to do this, and oh, by the way, if we do, <laughs> you know, here's this possibility, it changes the dynamic a lot. So as, as, uh, as unphilosophical as it is, I guess, or something, I think just the fact of recognizing that, uh, that uh, you got some walking around money with this to do some things and the ought to use that back to, uh, uh, to bring people on board and, and get stuff done. So Deb, one of the features that I know your local colleagues really like about this is 90% of, and you know, Ken earlier mentioned higher ed, and there's a whole set of higher ed money we haven't even started talking about, but just the, the um, 123 billion for K-12, 90% of that is going to pass through to locals and your local colleagues obviously are really excited about that part of the package. So how do we sort of marry getting the money to the locals and it's being allocated in a way to try to get it towards where there's there's bigger equity challenges um, with the formulas are being used. And then this issue that the governor just said, you know, $100 is more powerful than $101. How, how should we think about that? And you've, again, you've been on both sides. So you use the same opportunity with race to the top that the governor just talked about. Now you're on the local side. How should we think about that to like stitch those dollars together so we do get some 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 collective impact from them? Well, I hope that doesn't happen in my state. Um, you know, the the reason that locals are enthusiastic about this passing through to us is because every community is different, as the governor said, and the needs are different, but also the areas of focus that need to be built upon are different. So in our district, for example, one of our priorities will be uh, around expanded learning. And that is both because we know that our students, you know, emerging from this, they need more time together in super engaging ways. 
Um, but it's also because we have, while we are a low funded state in terms of <clears throat> per pupil operational dollars for, for schools, we, we, are, we have a very rich community with lots and lots of, um, and, and when I say rich, I don't mean financially rich, I mean like robust community with lots of um, organizations that are out there serving kids. And we have spent years now building um, a community of learning. And so it, our focus on expanded learning allows us to build upon what we've created in our community, expand that, and then allows us back to that point of sustainability to make sure that we're building it and making these investments in a way that means that the summer learning and the before and after care uh, that has infused learning is in it isn't just something we're able to do for the next two or three years with the money that we're getting, but is actually helping us to create something that we had already started creating. You know, if our, if our state came along and said, you know, oh, well, you know, we have a big, I don't know what, you know, say focus on STEM or something. So we're all gonna do that. And we're like, okay, well, you know, ours was extended learning, culturally responsive, culturally sustaining instruction and focusing on that equity value that we've had for more than five years now and literacy, and now we're gonna, you know, because we all wanna be collaborating, gonna do something around STEM, that wouldn't be what we need nor what we um, have to build upon and want to, uh, and, and, are, and are primed to sustain. I wanna come back on this district issue, but I wanna get Lillian back in, who's, who's been able to come back in by phone. Lillian, I, you- I don't, okay, great. You, you talked about evidence and using evidence and so forth. What's your advice on, I mean, the timelines here, once a state, once the, once the money hits the state, it needs to be pushed out, I think in 60 days down to the locals and so forth. But there's a, there's, a, there's a long timeline that people can wait to even get this money obligated. So what's your advice on sort of, there's obviously going to be a pressure. People are going to want this, all this money's out there. They're going to want to get it into their states. But what's your advice on sort of, planning and using evidence just given how once you once you essentially start this process how how quick the timelines are well i think it's something that the governor and deb said earlier this this is a different time from the last infusion of of big dollars that we got from the federal government and people and districts and schools have lived through this incredible year so we we know we have a better idea of where the gaps are to me, um, schools and districts should already have plans based on informal data anyway. They know where technology is needed. They know where uh, professional development for teacher training uh, with remote learning is needed. They know those students, hopefully we know by now, those students who are already behind when they left and what kind of learning loss has already gone. So planning for tutoring, for mentoring, for extended school years, uh, school days. So the districts and schools have some immediate data right at their fingertips because they've had to struggle through this experience where those funds could be used immediately while they have um, a little bit of a runway to be more thoughtful about how to use the totality of the funding. Would any of you all advise a state to wait a little while and do some planning? And this is bringing in, we're starting to get some audience questions all like, is there, is there a way to be strategic and marry that the 10% and the set asides at the state level with that 90% if you hit pause and did some planning? I mean, Ken, would you, if you were still leading a state, would you rush, would you want to rush right in or would you want to try to hit pause and wait uh, until you put a claim on those funds? No, I mean, well, I, I would want to do, oh, I'm... Okay. go ahead, go ahead, Lily, and then we'll come back to Ken. No, no, I'm sorry. No, 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 no. Go right ahead, Ken. I'm sorry. I mean, doing incredibly complex work in an incredibly compressed timeline, it's just crazy talk. And, and we know that anyone who went through Race to the Top knew that the work was super important, but the timelines and overlapping all of the workflows at the same time just produced in inevitable, predictable consequences. So if we don't reflect on that, then you know it's, we're, we're jumping in the same hole again. So I would absolutely slow things down, not just try to go where we've always gone before, but try to build upon, as Lillian just mentioned, and as, as Deb has, has been working on, we've done incredible work around uh, technology enhanced learning. We've done incredible work around investing in our, our, uh, our people in order to be nimble and flexible in unprecedented times. So those would be obvious things to extend 
But if, and, and if we do this, all the smart people in the room just come up with plans for everybody else, you know, you're gonna have resistance right off the bat. So I would absolutely slow things down, bring, bring people in, the people who are gonna to have to actually execute on the work, which of course includes the teachers, and try to figure out where the low hanging fruit is and where you can extend it. And if you just think you can rush your way through this because you're smart, you're, you're deluding yourself. I'd like to, um, Deborah, let me just argue with you just a little bit about the, um, about, about that. I mean, um, I mean, especially given what Ken just said, I think it's really important for the state, which after all is the place where the constitutional responsibility for the where the education system lies typically in that, um, to, to guide the process. It's definitely not one size fits all. I mean, the needs of one urban school district are very different from some, some other place and, and so on. But if I think about the time in Tennessee, I mean, we had 95 counties, some of them had multiple school districts. I can't recall the number, but we had 130 school districts in the, uh, in the area. It ranged everything from the Memphis and Nashville school systems. And, you know, Deborah, I mean, if your twin brother or sister was running the Nashville school system, I would have no problem writing a check and you've got the process in place. But the differences in the capability of these different school systems to go through the process that Ken is describing and to handle the money and how you do it is enormous. And I think that if you just um, if you just treat them as all the same and having the same kind of prerogatives and so on to do that, you're really just setting yourself up for a lot of really bad uses of the, uh, of the money because it's done, it's done too quickly or it's not about the level of knowledge you might, you might need. They're very different than different districts. Well, I certainly can understand that. And I recognize that different districts for a whole variety of reasons might be in different places. Um, I think that, and I also think that depending on the size of the district, that your point earlier, Governor, about uses of funding, that there could be really valuable ways in which districts could work together with support from their district leader, from their state leadership. To maximize their investments. So I, you know, I get that. Um, you know, I'm in a state that our um, elected officials, um, not not um, across the board. We certainly have a number of folks who support public education, but we're not a state that um, that puts public education at the forefront. And um, the way that Tennessee has with, with governors who've been both Republicans and Democrats for many, many years. Um, and so, uh, you know, I think again, the local context is very different. We have an amazing state chief and I'm confident that we'll work collaboratively with her. I think from an accountability standpoint, you know, we ought to be you know, the plans that we're creating, what we're intending to do with the money, doing what we said we were going to do, measuring it, being accountable for both doing what we said we were going to do and getting results, that all of that needs to be there as well. What I think is uh, two things. One is that please don't make us wait. Our kids need support now. And for us to be able to get summer programming in place, we we can't have delays. Summer programming that all needs to be we're, we've already have it planned, you know. So we cannot wait. Our kids can't wait. But um, but the intentionality around the planning and expecting that there has been planning and is important. And depending on what people have had in place and what they have to build on, they may or may not they may need more time for that. But don't hold back those who are ready. Um, I forgot my second one, but yeah. Well, you, you make good points. You make good points. There, there, there's. There, I mean, one of the things that's that is so hard about education reform in general is just sort of how distributed it is in in our country. I mean, it's. Um, um, uh, I mean, in Tennessee, there's all these local school districts with local elected school boards, and then there's the state, and then there's the interaction with the federal government, and uh, and um, I found it very difficult to do anything at scale because of that. It was always a frustration. It was always a frustration to, to me. It's uh, because you, you don't have some integrated organized thing where you can issue orders or pass laws or something and it all automatically happens. It's just a much, much bigger, more amorphous thing. 
Andy, uh, Deb just mentioned something super important and it, it makes sense she would think of it because she's doing the work and I'm sitting in my basement right now. Um, but the idea of summer school, so we've got this problem of, of learning loss. I think there's an incredible pressure just to occupy that problem with over assessing the learning loss. I think good teachers will know where the, where the gaps are, but uh, summer school is one of the models and that would be solved at the local level. The other model that I think requires some collaboration across, across state lines is this idea of high dose tut tutoring. What does tutoring look like at scale and how do we deploy people in a non-traditional way to get to kids, meet them where they are and, and help them you know, achieve not all of the standards, but the standards that are determined to be whatever you call them, power standards, anchor standards or whatnot, just to catch kids up as much as possible. And that has to be a, a test, retest, rapid cycle to see what works and what doesn't work. And I don't know that any district or any state on their own would be best positioned to do that. I know at Brown, for example, there's a, a lab that's committed to studying the idea of high dose tutoring and getting models out as soon as possible. But that would require some leadership and I think it would be best cross state leadership. Do you worry all, all four of you like things like I should say in full disclosure, we're working with that Brown project that that Ken just mentioned. I don't know if Ken knows that, but to be transparent. Um, is there any concern though, like on tutoring, for example, that there could just be a real gold rush here? Um, so again, there's gonna be a bunch of money hitting relatively fast and that we could, you know, a bunch of money. We, we saw this with we we went through this in, in a different way with, with No Child Left Behind and the tutoring provisions that were part of that law. That you essentially we we get a gold rush and this is great if you're a tutoring provider but not necessarily great in terms of, of student impact pick on kids who need the most help well, one of the models that I, I know people are looking at is pay for performance so you get paid when you can demonstrate that you've made progress which would help to break just the seat time requirement that would might drive people just to say that they've accomplished things that they haven't i'm not as close to that work as it, it sounds like you and your team are but breaking the, the, the patterns on, on hybrid learning versus place-based learning, as well as per, uh, performance outcomes versus uh, legacy seat time outcomes, it would seem that this would be the time to take that on. One of the things about the tutoring that um, we need to pay attention to is who's preparing the tutors, right? Uh, some districts are trying to go through and look at the salient um, skills and knowledge in each grade level so that they can laser-like focus on the um, learning progressions that students need to follow to be ready to go to the next grade. Um, so tutoring needs to also be very thoughtful about how we prepare um, and ready them to go out and actually work with students so that they have some kind of um, expectation or script in um, un unfolding the lessons for the students and knowing what interventions are appropriate, which aren't. I, I do get concerned that we just flood the market with a bunch of tutors if they're not through some intermediary source who does pay attention to the preparation for those tutors who will be with our students. Everybody can't just show up and tutor and get the result that we need to get with our students um, along a learning progression. A, a question, you, you all may are much more involved with this stuff day to day than I am anymore, but I would, are there also, when you start to think about how you react to COVID in 2020, uh, I, would, I would think there also would be mental health, for lack of a better word, issues with both students and teachers. Um, is there anything in, in this to, to try to deal with some of those issues? I mean, they, I mean, they wait more important than the, the lack of classroom learning over a period of six months or something. Yeah, I mean, uh, absolutely. And so when I was talking about those crises earlier, I, I, the mental health crisis in our country, while it wasn't new to the pandemic, was certainly exacerbated by the pandemic. And it's all related. It's related to the economic crisis. It's, you know, there's so much going on, but there's no question that we're going to need to focus on that. And I think it's a great example of the kind of thing that um, we need to put more energy in and build structures and systems that we can and should sustain, um, that we should have been doing before, but now we're going to have the resources to do them and we have an even greater need to focus on those right now. So part of our plan will be an emphasis on that social emotional learning, embedding that throughout our organization and the work we do, but also um, 
the wellness teams that we put in place at, at our schools through the pandemic, we will continue those, provide additional supports to them, the, the wellness hotlines for families, for students, for teachers, all of those are kinds of things that, that we intend to, to continue um, beyond because there is so much recovery that needs to happen. I will also say that um, when I was talking about summer, I really appreciated the point about that, you know, we don't see this as a, we've got to, you know, fix the kids kind of a situation, but rather like bringing them back, engaging them. So the summer programming that we're planning will have academic um, richness and robustness in it, but it will also be fun. It will be, you know, kind of a camp-like experience. We need to bring kids back together, get them enjoying their peers together and embed the learning within all of that kind of experience. So I want to, something the governor and I talked about, I'm, I'm weaving some questions in that we're getting out of the Q&A box. And so I'm going to, I'm going to weave two together. One, what's the what's the role? The, and the, the governor talked about this. I'd like to hear from, from the rest of you on sort of what do you need from nonprofit community based partners in helping meet some of these challenges, particularly some of the kinds of challenges you've put on the table. What's your advice, Lillian, as a both former superintendent and former state superintendent? Like, what, what's your advice there? And then second, just at the state level, one of the people, there's been some questions about what kind of capacity is needed. And one of the things that struck me, and you know, we were involved, we consulted with states with race the top and, and recovery dollars. The capacity we kind of came and then the consultants kind of moved on and there wasn't capacity left behind. There was like resident in these agencies. And so you still have the same problem. There's some great people, but they're just overmatched in terms of like hours in the day and the week versus the amount of work that's in, in front of them. So what do we need to do to provide that kind of support uh, and, and build that in? And then again, like what's the role of these various groups that are in, in different states and communities um, operating now? That, that's, that's, that's for all of you. Lillian, do you wanna start? Yes, I, I will say that a lot of the work that we got done around capacity building would not have happened without support of nonprofits and intermediary sources. We simply didn't have the capacity. Um, states collect a lot of data. The Department of Education collected a lot of data, but we didn't unpack the data and use it in ways that could be most beneficial. So, for example, we worked with the Center for Education Policy Research, Tom Kane, and his team around the strategic data project that came actually put embedded people within the department to actually um, build databases so that we could follow the things that we needed to follow to align to the strategy that we had for improved performance. So one has to understand going in, that's a part of staving off the funding cliff, is you bring in capacity to help build these systems, but it has to be embedded with the people who will be there when they leave um, so that the salient skills are left behind. But we can't do all that we need to do with the, by pushing new work into what is a traditional schedule for a teacher or a district leader or a state leader. We do need to bring in extra capacity, but how we use the capacity to also embed professional development matters. I'll give you one example. Uh, we brought in Larry Berger and Amplify to bring in data coaches to help us start planning from school to school and every school had to have a team um, to look at data every week. And there also had to be a school administrator as a part of that team. So while they were coming in, leading us through these data conversations, they were also training the people who would be left behind how that works and how to facilitate those discussions. Um, yeah, we have to use our nonprofits and intermediary organizations because they have capacity sometimes that a lot of our schools and districts don't have, especially some of our smaller schools and districts. Ken? You, you've been a, a, an advocate for states and a thoughtful critic. Like, what, what, do, you, what do you see as the opportunity and the risk here and what do people need? In terms of external capacity? Yeah, and, and how do we make sure that this works? Because I mean, there's, there's folks in these state agencies who are just drowning with everything going on right now. And now yeah. it's like, go spend a couple of billion dollars. Yeah, so state people are gonna have to get comfortable real quickly with shared distributed leadership. If they think they can bottleneck all of this stuff, they're gonna have another thing coming. It goes to Deb's point before, don't make my life more difficult. There are organizations that are out there that have been vetted locally. They have credibility locally. Now you need to have, there's, a, there's always a trade-off between accountability and, and speed. 
right? The faster you go, the more risk there is around accountability. And we're going to have to find that sweet spot in that trade-off. But I think if there's timelines looming, you're going to have to go fast, which means you're going to have to rely on people's judgments about who the partners are that can that can deliver. I think pay for service models are, are important, but we're not going to have time to work through all the kinks. But in, in Providence, for example, there are so many local uh, organizations with credibility that can execute quickly. And the people who are doing the work, the teachers and the superintendents and the principals, they know who they are. So shared distributed leadership is going to have to be the mantra for state leaders. Deb, in your seat, lo you know, local superintendent, what do you need from what do you need from community groups? What's going to be most helpful? And what do you need in terms of capacity at the district level? Well, I think there are two different, I would think about these as two different categories of, of help. So I mentioned earlier the expanded learning and the, the you know, wonderful organizations that we have across our city. And we have, we have a reading partners program. So we have uh, high quality tutoring that's, that's already happening. We have nonprofit organizations that are helping us to expand our school day and our school year and so forth. And those are the partners that we, that we know well, we're building relationships with, we're we're going to bring them into this work and then continue the work will be able to will be able to continue it um, beyond but then there's another category of expanded um, quality uh, supports and those are the you know the uh, TNPs of the world and and those kind of groups that can help build capacity and the way that we've used those kinds of organizations in the past is to help us to uh, um, change culture and practice, but also to build capacity within the district. And so helping us to uh, create, create teacher leader programs in which we are supporting teachers as leaders, school building leaders as well, so that, that once those groups goes, go away, we have that kind of um, capacity within our district. So um, that's a, another kind of partner that I think is also important. It's just a different kind of work. Terrific. We're coming up on we're coming up on time. Um, so I want to give you guys this will be like the lightning round. Like, what did we not? I mean, this is, you know, what's what's remarkable is we're talking about the third, the new new rescue package, but there's two previous ones that's that states and school districts are still spending out. So like there's no way we can do all of this justice in an hour. Um, but we covered a lot of ground and a couple of really big issues and some obvious tensions are gonna come up around things like MOE and 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 state local just very quickly lightning round like closing thoughts closing thoughts and advice sort of uh, to, to your colleagues out there who are who are starting to try to wrestle with this enormous challenge so uh education came into living rooms all across the country families see into schools in a way that they never saw it before we cannot ignore that record numbers of people are opting into homeschooling we cannot ignore that so we have to pay attention to the family voice and figure out how to make tweaks to our system, not to undermine the system, to make it stronger, make tweaks to our system to make it more responsive to what families and kids want. Great, Lillian? Actually, if you don't mind, because that was gonna be mine too, um, just families. And that again, that was necessary before, made more evident and it allowed us to exercise it in new and different ways for the last year. And we have to and have a huge opportunity in building upon that and thinking about that relationship in a more uh, deep and dynamic way. I would also say the opportunity to use this moment for transformation and, and they're related, uh, but thinking about the way in which school looks and feels and is done differently um, is also going to be, an, it's an opportunity and a necessity. Sorry, Lillian, jump in. No, that's fine, Lillian. I want to give a no, last word, Lillian. That, no, that's a great segue. Uh, Deb uh, brought up a point I was going to make. I've heard from people that as much as we've lost some students in this process, there are some, especially on the secondary level, that didn't show up in a physical space every day that have been actively engaged via remote and virtual learning. So I do think the transformation of how we deliver. Um, Instruction gives students agency and voice on what works best for them and use this experience to um, address the needs as we believe are most appropriate for individual students. Trick and Governor, you get the last word. Like what, what, what you, you've watched this from a couple of perspectives. What's your, what, what's your closing advice and counsel? Great opportunity. And um, 
I guess I would agree with Deborah that I don't always, don't always believe in the notion of, you know, Pisces you have to, you have to seize. But uh, I think of it differently that if you think about what you want to do, sometimes the planets align or stuff just comes together. It may be a crisis, it may not, where these things are possible. I think we're at that point over the next two or three years. And I hope that everyone will think about this, respect the enormous differences between, for example, urban and rural school districts and, and their needs and so on, and really use this, um, uh, you know, this bounty in a way that, uh, in a way that really helps the, the children of this country. Yeah, I think that's a great note to end it on. I mean, I'll use the prog of the chair to say, we're, we're looking at just in K-12 and just this package, again, not the previous packages, 123 billion. It seems like if we don't have something pretty dramatic to show for that from the point of view of public education, people are going to ask some pretty hard and pretty deserved questions. And so this is a this is a big moment. This is a big moment for the sector. I want to thank everybody who joined us. Uh, if you want to keep an eye on our programming, we're actually going to do a whole series with local superintendents, including the superintendent from Nashville, Denver, Hartford, and some other and some other cities. That's coming up, and so that'll be. Uh, starting the end of this month and into April and keep an eye out for our other programming. And, and we do appreciate you uh, coming and spending part of your day with us. And I really appreciate Lillian, Ken, Bill, Deborah. Thank you all so much for your time and, and your really terrific insights today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Andy. Thanks, Andy. Bye, you guys. Bye now.